Hey, it's your open source advocate, and every week I bring you new open source self-hosted software that is absolutely amazing. I hope you'll like, subscribe, and tell your friends about this channel so they can come along on the journey with us. Now let's get started. So I had a request recently um, to do a video on a system called the Zamad Ticket System. Uh, I think that's how this is pronounced. It may be Zamad. Um, but basically it's a help desk ticketing system. It's open source. It's free. Um, you can get out there and install it. So I've gone through the process to install it here on my local server and I'll go back to the install process a little bit later in the video. But first I wanted to kind of show you what comes up when you first get it running. So um, first off, we're going to get this installation wizard. So I'm going to run through that real quick and just type in my info. Okay, it was. So I did not use a strong password the first time I typed it in. I was trying to just keep it simple. But apparently it wants to have a strong password. That error message that says can't create user wasn't really helpful. Uh, it'd be great if they would uh, give you a little bit more detail. But uh, all right, organization name. So this is your company name. If I have a logo, you'd put it here. I don't have my logo image on this machine, but normally you could just uh, click here, I imagine. Uh, you can say upload. It'll let you pick a file. Um, so I'm just going to cancel out of that. I don't have my logo right now. That's okay. And the system URL. So in this case, it is this IP address. Um, later on, we'll set it up so that we've got our Nginx Reverse Proxy Manager um, set up to point to it, and we can give it a URL so that, of course, if you had clients trying to get to this portal to see the status of their tickets or enter a new ticket for you, then it would be really easy for them to find. They wouldn't have to use an IP address. So this is okay. So I'm going to use SMTP because I do have an SMTP server for email. So once you filled out your SMTP credentials, you just hit continue. And it's going to try to send that email. I'm guessing that it can't. So I'll try to take this out, but it's, it's going to fail because it's incorrect. So what we'll do is we'll go back to uh, the local MTA. There may be something that I have to set up differently, but I imagine within this program it's having an issue because I have Start TLS enabled and it's not liking the way that it's trying to validate me. So once we get in, it's going to take us through a nice little walkthrough. So it tells you about the dashboard where you'll get a nice overview of your and your other agents uh, information and tickets and status. Here you've got a search and they use the asterisk as the wildcard character in your search. So if you have something where you know that's partially it but there's going to be more then you can type in something and put an asterisk or um, you can put an asterisk in the middle of your search to kind of make things wildcard in there. So you can find the things that you want which is kind of nice. A lot of searches just are very much keyword related and, and they don't give you that wildcard capability. So here at the bottom, you've got kind of your control menu, I guess you'd say, where you can create new users, new tickets, new organizations, and things like that. Also at the bottom, you've got your personal settings next to your avatar down here, which I'm sure you can update in the settings at some point, but for now it just gives you uh, initials. And then finally, here's your overview of what's going on in your world, which means basically your tickets, you know, which ones are assigned, which ones are ready, which ones are pending, which ones are complete. All right, so once we finish the little walkthrough, we have the ability to kind of move around here in the user interface. So you have an activity stream. Um, this is something that I actually use quite a bit in Confluence for my regular uh, day job. Um, they have an activity stream there that lets me kind of follow what's going on. Um, Jira also has this capability, which I use, so I set that up where I can see what's going on in, in my team. Um, and it's kind of nice to be able to glance over and see what's happening. And, and, you know, a lot of times I catch something there where I didn't get tagged on it, but maybe I should kind of be involved in that discussion. Um, so, so it's really nice to have kind of an activity stream. And this really helps whenever you have multiple people on a team who maybe somebody's having a problem and you see them put in a comment on a ticket and you know how to fix that thing that really can help improve your desktop support and your your client support so activity stream is kind of a nice feature so right now there's there's not a lot of integration set up there's nothing really set up but you can see here you get kind of this overview in your dashboard that tells you here's the wait time here's things that are chats you know just different ways of communicating and working on stuff um, so here you've got assigned information. So I think um, once you get some things, you can click onto this. Right now we don't have anything to click on. So you get this nice dashboard right out of the box. Um, we saw this when we first opened up the software. It'll update as you move along. So here you can see there's a little single bar for that one little test uh, ticket that I put in. 
The other part that you get is this tab that says first steps and this really is there to help you kind of make sure you get everything set up so it kind of checks things off as you do some of those and complete some of those items so this is just a nice place to look and see what else do you need to do to get the system set up and ready for production use this is pretty easy um, pretty straightforward so far if we come to the settings section you'll see there's a lot of settings that just let you set up the actual system for your business so in my case my business is fixed at Del Rio I would of course set it up so that was the name of the product and I would give it the organization name, um, you know, just so on and so forth. I mean, so the product name, you know, is, is Zamad, Del Zamad Help Desk, but they let you basically um, change that to suit your needs. Of course, down here you can put your own logo, and then they show you what it's going to look like on the login screen and so forth. Then you can change the locale to wherever you live so that it sets up the, the language correctly and of course set the time zone so it picks it up right off of the server in my case which is great. Um, and then you can set up basically a pretty date for, for how things look. As you move down through the system settings there's quite a bit here that you can actually set up so it's worthwhile to go through kind of click through the different tabs and see what's going on with the different settings that you can set. So as you move through this, you'll see a lot of things that are just base system kind of settings that you want to have set up for a production system. Security. So again, working and, and looking around and checking your system before you put it into production, making sure you have all the security settings the way that you want it. So in this case, setting up passwords to be strong passwords is really important. And then you can set up some automatic account linking uh, for a lot of different uh, sites. So it, it's very much up to you to kind of go set this stuff up, but realize that it's here and you can set it up if you want to use it. Setting up the actual ticket system itself is, is pretty important since that's what the whole thing surrounds, right? The whole purpose of this software is for setting up help desk and support tickets. Um, so ticket management is really important. And as you move down, you get into integrations, API, and, and just a lot more settings. I don't want to spend a ton of time on all the settings and things. Um, there are probably a few that you want to focus on as you go through the software. So as always, user management is very important. And then roles and groups. So you can set up groups for your users to be a part of, and you can set up roles for your users to have as permissions sets, basically. So you want to make sure that you set those up properly and that you have them set up the way you want them. And then as your users either register or you add users, you can add them to those roles and to those groups. Finally, organizations. So this doesn't have to have a single organization. You could have users from different organizations working within the same product, and you can assign those users to those organizations as well. So you can create a knowledge base, and then you can add data to it. So just think of that as a wiki. It's a place to store information and share knowledge. That's exactly what it's for. It's a database of information that other people have either learned, stumbled upon, found, whatever it is. Um, and it makes it really nice because your users can then go check that knowledge base whenever they come across problems they haven't seen before to see if someone else has already solved that. So it does appear that there's some package management, so there may be some extra packages that you can get. I don't know what those are, um, and I'm not sure where you get them from at this point, but it looks like you can download a file and then browse for it and then install that package. Um, if you just click install the package, it's not going to do anything because there's nothing for it to work with. So I'm going to create a ticket real quick. So here you add up your customers and your customers get put into the database. So be careful what you do with this data and make sure that you secure these databases because you're putting people's information in here. These become prime targets for, for um, not so nice people. So be really careful when you're putting information in about customers. Mobile phone, no. Fax, no. Department, he's just a person. He has an address, so 101. Password, he could have a password. Is he a VIP? All customers should be VIPs. And Bob is awesome. Okay. And permissions, he is a customer. So that's what we're going to set, and we're going to save him. There we go. So now we've got Bob in there, and the text of our ticket. I'm the owner, I'm going to call this new, call this high, and I'm 
There we go, a couple of tags, and we'll create a ticket. So I've got my first ticket in the system. And you see what comes up here, issues with VPN. So I can enter a note about this ticket. I can select an attachment if I need to and add that, that's nice. I can close this or I can open this, cool. And there I've updated the ticket and you can see the note that I've left. So other users come in and look at the ticket, they can see kind of what you're doing. There we go, update the ticket and I'll go reboot the server. So I'm just gonna say it's closed. Everything worked properly. So as I was digging around, I realized that not only is this a, a ticketing system with some pre-built forms, but I, sh I talked earlier about the form designer and the setup. So what I did was I went through and added a field here and it's just called OS type. And basically you can select what type of OS your supported person might be using. This can be really important to be able to add these types of fields. So that's not all just in the notes, but something that could be searched on later. So what happens is um, if you go over to the settings, you can move down um, into the system settings down here. And when you go to objects, it'll load up this screen here and you can see there's tabs for the different items across the top here. So you can actually add objects for user information, for organization information and for group information as well. But on ticket, I just did add a new object and you get this form. Now when you give it a name, you can't put any spaces in the name, so you don't want to put spaces. But let's just say that we wanted to add um, distro, and then you can also just give it distro as the uh, next field there. You want to make sure that it's active. So this can be text, but if you want to change that, you can change the field type that it's going to be, and you can pick from these different ones. So you have Boolean where you're talking about true false. You have a date for date time. Uh, both of those options there. You have integer, which is just a number, a whole number. Of select, which is what I did on the previous one where we set up uh, different types of uh, OS types. Text, which is just a text box that they can fill in. And then tree select, which I'm not really sure, but it, that maybe that's got some dependency in it. Uh, we can click on that just to see kind of what it looks like when you try to set it up. Oh yeah, so you set up a key and then you can add a row or you can add children under that key. So you could say this is Linux and instead of, uh, I could have done a tree select instead of the um, main selection box up, up above and I could have said Linux and then I could have added children where it was each distribution. Ubuntu, Fedora, CentOS, uh, Manjaro, Arch, just on and on and on. Um, you know, just to give your help desk support people a little bit more information. And this is just an example. So for any field you can think of, you can go through and basically add the information that you want for those fields. So if you do select, you get a similar looking uh, option here. You'd put in a key. Um, in my case, when I did the OS type, I did uh, win. So in this case, I might do this for Ubuntu. And it alphabetized it uh, afterwards for me. Um, you can set one as a default and then click add. And as you go through adding each one, you just keep doing that and keep adding. So we'll add one more here. And you wanna click add to make sure you actually get it in there. Once you've got that, you can go through and kind of select which, uh, which people this shows up for. So whether it's your users or your customer agents, um, things like that. So once you've kind of got that set, you can say whether it shows up for them and you can make it required or not required. So if you check the box then the field becomes required um, for edit or for add. If you don't check the box then it's just optional. So once you do that, you click on submit and then you have to click this button here that says update. And what it's going to want to do is it's going to want to update the database. So when you do this, it's going to tell you you need to update the database and it tries to give you um, the setup for a command so it's kind of funny looking um, but if you set this environment path it would try to automatically update the database in the background um, I find it's easier just to restart the containers in this case but here you've got basically your app um, I think it's app underscore 
uh, restart underscore CMD, and then you have to put in a bunch of stuff. So if you, if you can kind of read through this and get rid of the uh, HTML, you could set this up as an environment variable. For me, it's easier just to go here to my portainer, and I'm going to go back into my containers. And you can see here all the things that I have. Uh, I've already filtered it, so if you don't filter and you have a lot more containers, you can just type up here to start filtering and get it down to the ones you want. And then basically just check those boxes and you're just going to hit uh, restart right here and it's going to try to restart all of the containers and as the line goes across once it kind of gets over here to the other side you'll start seeing the green toasts pop up to tell you things are getting restarted and after it does the restart it goes back to that process so it's updating the database and it goes through a little bit of a build process so again be patient when you start trying to restart so there you can see the toast messages coming up that things are starting to try and uh, actually restart and there come a few more so once that's done we'll go back over here and we'll just refresh our application and you'll see that it's going to go to the 502 bad gateway initially because again you have to be a little bit patient so here we can see that everything's running again but if we go here right away and refresh you get the 502 bad gateway so we'll give it just a minute and then we'll come back and, and refresh and check on this so if you want to see what's happening, you can click into on, on Portainer, you can look at the logs for um, the init, or if you're using CTOP, you can do the same way um, on the init container, and you should get this line that says updating the database. So what happens is it goes through and it's updating the database, and then it should continue on with more information when it's ready to get the whole thing started again. Okay, now we're back up, so everything is up and running again. And if we go back to add a ticket, so now if we scroll down, you'll see we have our new field, and you can pick from the options that we entered, and it alphabetized them for us, which is really nice. That means you don't have to think about that ahead of time. So as you do this, uh, one suggestion I would have is if you have a lot of fields you want to add, I would add four or five at a time, and then restart the system, uh, just to get a feel for if there's going to be any errors. Um, you know, maybe one field type doesn't work so well or something, you might want to avoid that. It'd be good to know that before you tried to add 50 or 60 fields and then tried to restart and everything just didn't work for some reason and you had to start over. So um, just my suggestion, but this is really extremely flexible system uh, from this perspective because now you can go through and really create a system that collects a lot of the information that you're wanting and that helps you become successful in a support organization. So that's a quick overview of the user interface for uh, Zamad ticket system. It's not bad. Um, Actually, this is really nice. If you're if you're a you know a person trying to find a ticketing system that will work in a small organization, this would be really great. Um, I don't know how much it scales out or how well it scales out, but um, pretty cool. So let's go back through the actual install of the system, and I'm going to do that out there on the web so that we can actually set this up not just on my home network, but we can set it up with a reverse proxy and get to it with a URL. I'm logged into my VPS and you can see here I've got quite a few containers running but there's really not much happening you know it's just not not much going on so that's okay so I'm gonna just get out of this and we'll clear out there and I'm gonna go and actually open up the instructions for getting this on my desktop installed and there's a couple things I need to do so it'd be nice if they put these things towards the top but it's close so they say do git clone, you know, just, just get this thing. So that's basically download the, the software. So we're just going to highlight that. And then we're just going to go back to our terminal. We're going to paste it in. We're going to hit enter. And it's going to pull down that code. So now if we do an ls, we'll see the directory here in the list. So we can cd into that directory. And we can do another ls just to see what's in there. And you can see there's a docker compose file, a docker, a docker compose override file, and there's something we need to do in here depending on your situation. So we'll go through that in a minute. But first in their instructions, it's a little bit further down, but they actually want you to set the yeah, system vmax up a bit. So we're going to do this. Now, if you're not logged in as root, you need to do this with sudo in front. So just be aware of that. But we're going to grab that. I'm going to type sudo, hit space, and then I'll paste that in. And then it's going to ask for our password. And there you go. So it sets that count to what we wanted. Okay, that step's done. We can go back to the instructions. So basically all we need to do is run the Docker Compose up. 
Now when you run Docker Compose up without a hyphen D out here, so we'll just go over here and paste it in and I'll show you what I'm talking about. If we run it just like this, you're going to get all of the output here in the terminal. If you do this, you're telling Docker Compose that you want to run this container as a daemon. Basically you want to run it in the background as a service so that when you disconnect from this SSH session or anything like that, the system keeps that running and you can still access the web server side of it. So that's, that's how you want to normally run it, is with this hyphen D. But, on this first go around, because it's going to pull down a lot of stuff, I'm going to run it this way, I'm going to let it record into the terminal, and you can see it, and then I'll kind of fast forward through all of that. So here you can see that we've hit a problem, basically it's trying to use port 80, and it gives us an error message. So it's telling us, hey, there's a problem doing this. I, you know, I can't move forward, which is fine. That's what we need to do with that override.yaml file. So what we're going to do is say nano docker compose override.yaml. And we're just going to go right here. And we're going to say 80, and I'm going to use 71. Now you can use a port that's open for you. Um, it doesn't have to be the same one I'm using, and then you want that to point to port 80. So host first, and then Docker container next. So the Docker container should still be 80. That's where this is expecting to run. It's just that my host has already got 80 used up. So I'm going to do save with control O, and then control X to get out of that. And we're just going to run the docker up command again. And it should go a little quicker this time. It doesn't have to download all of the images and do all of the things that it already did. Okay, so now that this is running, you can see everything is kind of going up the screen with a lot of text and information. Um, so this is what the running container looks like. Um, again, this is why you use the hyphen D in the background. If I was to hit control C right now, I wouldn't be able to access anything. But I do want to check and make sure that it's working. So we're going to go back here. And if we look at Portainer, um, we can refresh the Portainer containers view here. And I had 19 containers. Now I have 28. And you can see quite a few of them have the Zamod information on it, which is what we want. So now we're going to go to our IP address and we're going to go to our port number and we'll see if everything comes up. Yes, and it's coming up to the first run wizard which is what we want. But before we go through that I want to go back and change a few things and set some stuff up so that we can get to this within uh, with the actual domain name and uh, we'll go in and, and actually stop this and start it running as a daemon. So I'm going to close this I'm going to go back to my terminal. I'm just going to do control C. It's going to close out all of those con uh, running containers here. All right, so even shutting down the containers takes a little bit of time. So be patient whenever you restart things and stuff like that within this uh, container set. All right, so from here, I'm going to go over to my Nginx uh, proxy manager, which is the thing that we want to use to set this up. So we're going to go to forced. All right, so we're going to go into our um, apps here. And I'm just going to do uh, add a new one. And I'm going to give this a name and I'm just going to call it support. Uh, actually, let's call it desktop. Dot o <laughs> let's call this desktop. Dot open source is awesome. Dot com. And don't forget to tab when you're setting this up or it won't take the name. So, so don't forget about that. It'll empty it out if you don't do that. So we need 104. Now we're just going to put in the IP address of the server. And then over here we're going to put in the port number that we designated for this container. And we're going to save that. Now I've also got to go set up my actual domain registrar to forward that uh, subdomain. Alright, so once you're ready, you just create a new A record. Make sure to type in the name that you gave it for the subdomain. This needs to be unique. And then you put in the IP address that you want that to point to. And you can, of course, change this to be a little bit quicker. So we've done that. Now we're going to go back in and we're going to reset up all of those containers to start them running again. So we're going to go back to our terminal. And now we're going to do docker compose up. Here, I'll clear this out so it's easier. Do docker compose up hyphen D for daemon. We're going to kick that off, let it get those things started, and then we'll see if our URL is working correctly. There it goes. So after a little bit of patience and giving it time to get started up, we're back to the startup wizard. 
So from the startup wizard, you just say set up a new system, enter in your basic information for your admin user, create a password that's a strong password. It does want strong passwords right off the bat, so make sure you use a strong one. And then click on create. Um, so the organization name, I've already typed this in before on my home system, so it's just the browser is just kind of filling it out for me. Here you can pick your logo. Again, we've kind of been through this. And then here is the URL. So we'll just move forward. So the send mail, we've already kind of seen the issues with that. I'm not going to go through that. I'll just leave it here for now and continue forward. And we'll skip the email setup. And there we go. We're back to our start wizard, which I showed you in the first place. And we've got a new system set up and ready to run. So this is Zamod uh, Support Desktop. It's pretty pretty nice system. It's got a lot of really nice features. It's free, it's open source, it's out there for you. So if you've got a team, and especially a team who suddenly has gone remote, and you're doing things on Excel spreadsheets or shared documents or things like that, this may be a lot better system for you to start using. Um, this could be really a great stepping stone into something bigger if you need it. This may, you know, as long as this has continued um, development, it's going to get better and better over time as well. This is really a nice system. I hate to say a better system, um, a bigger system, but this is a pretty nice system. It's got a lot of integrations capabilities. So hope you like this. I hope it helps you. If you have questions, let me know. I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, one last thing that I've done. I'm going to leave this uh, site up and running. So you can see the URL up here. It is just HTTP. I'm not going to put the uh, SSL certificate on it. But if you want to try this out, you can go to desktop.opensourceisawesome.com and I'll put this in the description. But I created three demo users for you guys to log in and try out. So I've got demo-admin at opensourceisawesome.com, which is an admin user. And again, in the description, I'll put the username and the password. I also created an agent user. So there will be demo-agent again at opensourceisawesome.com and the username and password will be in there so you can see from different perspectives what these different users uh, perspectives are of the software and finally on the customer side I created demo client so demo dash client at opensourceisawesome.com and again in the description I'll have the username and password um, I'll leave this up for a couple of weeks and you guys can log in and just test it out and click around and create tickets if you want to um, you can kind of see what the system's about Hope that helps everybody figure out what this software is about and gives you a chance to check it out without having to do all the installation. If you enjoyed this video, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it, and I'll talk to you next time.